Uh, so we'll have the panel discussion now. Uh, it's my privilege uh, to welcome Dr. Professor Nagaraj Desai, who will moderate the discussion today. I'm sure he needs no introduction, but it's my duty to talk to you about Dr. Desai. He's, he's the director at Namana Medical Center, Bangalore, and also a visiting faculty at the Fortis Hospital. He is also the adjunct professor at JSS College in Mysore, chairman of Karnataka Cardiology Academy, and also adult cardiac practice for four decades, starting from 1981. He has also been the former professor and head of department of cardiology at uh, JSS Medical College as well as MS Ramayan. And the uh, doctor has published 72 papers and presented over 190 abstracts. So I welcome Dr. Desai on stage, please, and uh, request Mr. Mukesh to please welcome Dr. Rita Buke. We also have on the panel today uh, Dr. Pradeep Kumar. Dr. Pradeep Kumar is a senior consultant and interventional cardiologist at Saptagiri Specialty Hospital and he also has Dr. Pradeep's Cardiac Care Center in Bangalore with over 10 years of cardiology experience and with an expertise in management of heart attacks and other cardiac emergencies, complex coronary interventions device therapy for ASD, VSD and PDA, pacemaker implantation, balloon, valvotomies for wall diseases. My privilege and honor to welcome Dr. Pradeep Kumar on the panel today. Yeah, we also have Dr. Arun Kayan, who is a consultant nephrologist uh, we are happy to have a nephrologist in the panel so that we have different uh, viewpoints during the discussion. Dr. Arun is a chief nephrologist at Vaidehi Super Speciality Hospital and also at Bhavan, Bhagwan Mahavir Jain Hospital. In fact, uh, Dr. Arun initiated the nephrology department at Bapuji Hospital, JJ Medical College, Davangere, also at Bhagwan Mahavir Jain Hospital and Republic Hospital, Bangalore. He's been the past Vice President of the Indian Society of Nephrology Southern Chapter and Dr. Arun has more than six indexed publications and is the regular contributor to the Karnataka Medical Journal. Please welcome uh, Dr. Arun on the dais, please. And uh, I would request Dr. Desai to moderate the session and take it forward. Thank you, sir. How much time we have? It is uh, 9.20. What is the mood of the audience? <laughs> Want to finish it off quickly or you have enough time to deliberate the sessions? In fact, I just wanted to add on three more Nobel laureates. Dr. Black, who actually discovered the adrenal system. Of course, Dr. Uh, uh, James Black, he was, uh, I mean, Dr. Dale, who adrenal system was discovered by him. Dr. Black discovered propranolol, so-called indirol at that time. Eventually, the biochemical aspects of the adrenal physiology and the beta receptor physiology was described by Lafkowitz and uh, Kobelka from US. In other words, six Nobel laureates have been responsible for keeping the beta, rather adrenergic physiology going on and we continue to use beta blockers in our clinical practice. As Dr. Ram was mentioning, that the beauty of science is perpetuating the discovery and documenting it for the public good. With those words, let me just, you know, start with Dr. Arun, good friend of mine. In case he has to select a beta blocker in his practice, what beta blocker he would like to select and why he would like to select that beta blocker? Hold it. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Micro, for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Desai, for uh, uh, bringing me onto the stage and uh, 
thank you everybody who thought that a nephrologist has to be in a panel on hypertension and if somebody had doubts why is a nephrologist sitting here my special salutations to them the beta blocker of choice if i have to use has to be a larger molecule i am not looking at the patient's hypertension at the moment i am also looking at how i am going to control the hypertension once the patient goes on to dialysis so of the molecules available now carvedilol and vesoprolol are the two larger molecules and uh, these are not dialyzed so even in patients on dialysis we don't need to give a extra dose add to this the point that uh, next to ras blockade and uh, mrs the next major contributors to hyperkalemia are beta blockers so when you use drugs like metoprolol the chances of hyperkalemia are slightly higher as compared to the newer beta blockers and hence i would prefer these there have been a few studies uh, comparing bisoprolol and carvedilol there was one large study probably uh, from taiwan which uh, looked at uh, the upset was basically looking back at the history of patients who have been on this one so it was not really a uh, head to head study which showed a slight uh, better results with the uh, uh, bisoprolol and the other thing that happened was when uh, bisoprolol came into india with the nephrologist had just started using it and the innovators did a i don't know whether to call it a goof up or not they suddenly named it uh, from concar to concar car i don't know the reason why they did it so once it became a coronary drug why should i be using so probably at that time we shifted to carvedilol so if you look at the nephrology prescriptions if you uh, from 2015 to 2020 would be carvedilol will be much more but in the last 5 years carvedilol bisoprolol nebevilol all have almost uh, a similar uh, number i want to add yeah go ahead go ahead please go ahead you get one more mic for him please uh when we are discussing these questions anybody from the audience can kind of join in and ask a question or make a comment also yeah, yeah. go ahead uh i'd like to add a few points one is uh, there is a famous saying science is always wrong it never solves a problem without creating 10 more <laughs> i'll tell you why because all our lives we uh, spent uh, saying that there is a j shaped curve in hypertension no i i i request you want to you confine to the on thing. this yes, aspect yes. then you can go ahead. all right okay yeah. so coming to the choice of uh, beta blockers uh, propranolol in, in, with in, due respects the beta blockers in renal failure okay it was in renal failure yeah yeah that's what the question i had asked all right. i wanted you to comment on that simply because you know when we see the prescriptions of an nephrologist there will be a beta blocker definitely we want to know from him which is the best beta blocker and from the cardiologist point of view yeah which will be a good beta blocker for you all right sir yeah thank you so i just adding on to that i think uh, in ckd stage 5 uh, patients who are on dialysis again bisoprolol i think some studies are now found they have found that bisoprolol is more effective than the other drugs uh, coming back to the question uh, with due respects to propranolol this is one drug which is hated by cardiologists i don't see any almost any cardiologist prescribe this drug but it is loved by endocrinologists it is loved by gastroenterologists it is loved by neurologists i send my patient with any of those problems they will definitely come back with propranolol okay because there is uh, some reason behind it also if you consider migraine or anxiety or portal hypertension or thyrotoxicosis related it's still only propranolol which holds good because it is very highly lipophilic and it has its own uh, preferences in these particular conditions but when it comes to a cardiac point of view we are very very clear that uh, we need to say, uh, i mean choose only cardio selective or beta 1 selective beta blockers for a very long time metoprolol um held on to the fort but now the recent addition it's not a recent addition actually but it's coming up in a big way that is bisoprolol probably because for a long time bisoprolol was not available in combination with one more drug that is telmisartan one more wonderful drug 
So now that bisoprolol is also available in combination with telmisartan, I think it's uh, highly favorable with cardiologists also. Okay. Now I just wanted to uh, wanted you to make a comment. Pharmacokinetically, atenolol is exclusively excreted to the kidneys, whereas the bisoprolol is not. Hence, I prefer a bisoprolol when compared to other drugs because it is not excreted to the kidneys. What is your comment on that? It is a little tough question to answer because we know now that uh, the secretion-wise and the uh, pharmacokinetics of the drug do not really go hand in hand. But yes, definitely we have been talking all along that a drug which is secreted purely from the kidney has to be avoided when there is renal dysfunction. But still, the atenolol has been used in renal dysfunction and uh, sadly, nobody has done levels to see whether it really accumulates. But the side effects have not been excessive as compared to patients who had a normal kidney function. So, uh, though I'm, scientifically, I can't give you a study which can show that, but uh, sure. use-wise, it can be. Okay. Has been used. Sir, I think uh, there was one study which found that, I mean, the pharmacokinetic assessment, it says that bisoprolol is excreted 50% through the hepatic root, 50% through the renal root. So even if one of the organ is dysfunctional, maximum it can elevate, the concentration can go by twice. Since the therapeutic range is very high, right from 1.25 milligrams to up to 20 milligrams per day, it's a huge uh, uh, dosage. I mean, in my practice, I don't go beyond uh, 5 or 10 milligrams of uh, bisoprolol. With that, we reasonably achieve the heart rate. So, even with that, that is why they say that even with renal dysfunction or hepatic dysfunction also, there is an alternate way for elimination and it won't go very high. So, that way, I think it is still one of the preferred drug when compared to the other beta blockers. Uh, when, when you, uh, I, I just want to put this uh, question to the audience. You can raise your hands and, you know, answer this question. How many of you have converted today to prescribe beta blocker as a first-line therapy in your clinical practice for an uncomplicated hypertension? No converter. <laughs> Samak. Okay, there's one more added on. In other words, it looks like there is some kind of inertia to accept such new thoughts. What is your comment on that, Dr. Yeah. Uh, uh, frankly speaking, as a cardiologist, when I sit in my clinic, the commonest situation that I come across is hypertension. Um, so, we see a lot of hypertension. And I, I see many prescriptions where a patient, they're gone are the days where somebody calls you up and says that the BP is 180 or 190. Blindly, you can say, give him 5 milligrams of amlodipine. Okay, gone or those days. Because nowadays, if somebody says that BP is high, the next thing that you have to ask is the heart rate. So, as uh, Dr. Venkatram was also saying, heart rate is a vital sign. Because there is a patient with a 180 BP and a 110 or 120 heart rate. In this patient, if you are going to prescribe him amlodipine, it's not only not going to work, but because amlodipine causes reflex tachycardia, it's only going to worsen the situation. So, there are a lot of patients like this and in them, beta blockers should be the mainstay of treatment. The only thing is there were some issues about central aortic pressure, especially with atenolol and increased incidence of stroke. So, maybe as a monotherapy, there may be little hesitance, but there are patients who come specifically with sinus tachycardia in then even monotherapy you can give. But at least as a combination, as a second drug, beta blockers should be widely used. And going with the side effect profile, beta-1 selective beta blockers are extremely safe. Okay. Now, when once we are at the combination therapy, they mentioned about the bisoprolol with the telmisartan combination and they provided a small data set to say that, look, it works over 12 weeks time and then it is comfortable for you to reduce the blood pressure by 20 by 10. Now, what is your take on that? whether you would like to start with the telmisartan along with the bisoprolol or amlodipin with the telmisartan or bisoprolol with the hydrochlorothiazide. 
What is your what is your take on this? Why, why I mean, what what are the concerns that uh, pass through your mind when you use a combination therapy and bisoprolol as the central character? Because that is what we are trying to understand yeah. today. Yes. So, um, uh, elderly patients. Stroke. Any more, any questions from the audience or comments from the audience? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. So, in elderly patients or patients with a higher risk of stroke or a previous history of stroke or even smokers, it is told, uh, the combination of bisoprolol with amlodipine is preferred. Whereas, if there is any kind of cardiac abnormality as a post-MI, pressing indications, heart failure or a post-MI state, in all these situations, possibly telmisartan with uh, bisoprolol would be a preferred combination. Diuretic, of course, I'm not too keen on, uh, I mean, combi combining uh, a bisoprolol with a diuretic, but definitely with telmisartan and with amlodipine, they are very good combinations. Having said that, especially in newer onset hypertensives, Sympathetic overactivity and renin angio system, renin angiotensin system, these are two important pathways which contribute to the hypertension. So, if you can block both of these, you get a very good complementary effect. So, telmisartan takes care of the renin angiotensin system and bisoprolol takes care of the uh, sympathetic nervous system. So, it is a more logical and rational approach in treating anti I mean, hypertension. Any comments on this aspect? Yes, yeah. the, both the questions put together. Yeah. The previous question about somebody presents to me with a blood pressure of say 180 by 100 and no, name who has to be started on a treatment, obviously it has to be a calcium channel blocker which would be amlodipine. But just giving amlodipine would have a lot of uh, uh, sympathetic activity and uh, uh, raise in heart rate. So invariably the practice has been that I use amlodipine and a beta blocker. Uh, it may be carvedilal or bisoprolol, which uh, uh, along with amlodipine I use. So it, it would be roughly a first line drug if you can look at it. Uh, and definitely uh, not a sublingual medications, right? Yes. <laughs> I know. Uh, it's cardiologists like to stress this to every nephrologist, okay. but then you have to look at the practical aspects of it. Okay. Of course, I won't use it in Bangalore, but in a peripheral center, say, uh, I'm going to check Badapur, there, if, if somebody lands up with a high blood pressure, uh, knowing that somebody who has been on dialysis, whom I know who has uh, got okay coronaries, yes, we still use it a bit. Okay, you should be careful. Yeah. You should be careful. Okay, what is your pre opinion on using sublingual medications for hypertensive, uh, so called uh, severe hypertension? Yeah. Or you are not sure whether it is an urgent hypertension crisis or emergency hypertension crisis? Yes, sir. Um, in a clinic setting, it would be different. But if, if it is a crisis phase, where a patient is in a pulmonary edema or a hypertensive encephalopathy or a patient is having papillary edema or a patient is having an acute kidney injury. In, these are the situations where you need emergency reduction in blood pressure. These has to be handled in a hospital setting and in a hospital setting, I would not go for an unreliable way of uh, sublingual reduction or anything. I would rather start a in infusion of an NTG or a sodium nitroproside where I have a very highly controlled way of controlling the blood pressure and it acts moment to moment. The moment you feel that the BP is falling, you can reduce the dosage of an NTG or an SRP and immediately the BP will. So it's a much, much better control. And even in a situation like a stroke or so, more than 30% reduction is not recommended unless there is hypertensive emergency like what I, the situations that I told. Otherwise, it's reasonable to get it down by about 30% and then gradually over the next 10 to 14 days uh, to bring down the blood pressures to the target. But I would not prefer sublingual medications. When do you want to withdraw beta blocker in case you have to withdraw? And what circumstances are any concerns that you have? First, Dr. Arun, then followed by Dr. Pradeep. Yeah, bradycardia, of course. Next would be. Bradycardia uh, means, according to you, what is the heart rate that at which you would like to withdraw the medication or modify the dose? Symptomatic bradycardia, even at 50, or else 40 plus. And uh, uh, the other way to do it is if I have a doubt, I send them for ECG. Let them rest for a while. See, my recording may be 50, 55, but he's symptomatic. Do a ECG, you get a heart rate of 42, 43. Then, yes, definitely, I'm going to stop. Modify it. the medication. Modify, Modify or stop? Stop the beta blocker at the moment, at least. Till the heart rate comes back and then reassess 
so it can be hyperkalemia which i'll get it only after i get the reports oh, okay. so so it will so, so the first thing would be yes, i would stop the beta blocker if the heart rate was at that low. okay dr arun is talking of a ckd patient having a low heart rate and on beta blockers he is worried about the hyperkalemia but you as a cardiologist you have a patient on beta blockers yes how do you manage this blood i mean heart rate issue the heart rate is 50 you want to reduce or you want to withdraw or you want to modify what is your approach sir a patient who is on beta blocker if he comes with bradycardia he is totally asymptomatic he does not complain of any symptoms he does not complain of postural giddiness he does not complain of episodes of uh, you know blackouts or anything of the sort so heart rate is 50 i still don't mind i ask him to just take a few laps or do a few sit ups if there is no chronotropic incompetence there is no need to be very aggressive about reducing the beta blockers still long term i would prefer a resting heart rate of around 60 only not in the 50s or 45s so if it is sinus bradycardia we can be a little more uh, you know lenient towards aggressively uh, reducing the beta blockers but if the patient is having symptomatic heart blocks even a first degree heart block it is a precursor for a more sinister uh, thing that may happen later so if the patient is either in first degree or a second degree heart block yes we have to be aggressive about stopping the beta blockers next practical situation i'll tell you if a patient comes with an acute decompensated heart failure you know beta blockers are an intrinsic part of any heart failure treatment but in acute decompensated heart failure we should not start the patient on beta blockers till the patient stabilizes clinically diuretic should be the mainstay of treatment but if a patient who is already on beta blocker if they develop acute decompensated heart failure you need not stop the beta blocker you can treat for adhf that is uh, acute decompensated heart failure but you need not stop the beta blocker you can continue to uh, give the dose because suddenly stopping the beta blocker can cause rebound increase in the heart rate that can also be detrimental in these situations that is my take thank you people used to talk about the acute withdrawal of beta blocker phenomena could you explain that once again in this context uh i mean uh, in the sense the body has got used to a particular kind of beta blockade and whenever there is a chronic beta blockade going on there will be changes in the receptor numbers also there may be upregulation of the receptors so once you stop these beta blockers even that uh, little sympathetic activity that comes in they may cause an abrupt increase in sympathetic activity and as we all realize sympathetic overactivity is totally detrimental to the heart they may go in for acute episodes of pulmonary edema or an accelerated hypertension with flash pulmonary edema also and so, also acute myocardial infarction myocardial infarction yes sure. i'm glad that you brought out beautiful point when you are dealing with uh, beta blocker usage in the clinical practice and how you deal with the heart rate and importantly how exactly you would like to monitor such patients like exercising for about few steps and see what happens to the pulse rate now in case the patient's doses have to be escalated with the beta blocker therapy now you have a bisoprolol starting from 1.25 to something like 20 mg what is your approach how long you would like to wait and how much time would like to wait for you to achieve the so called the maximum dose or whatever you want to call it um, followed by in the presence of renal failure you can yes, just okay, yes sir yeah you can so uh, post mi patients or any patient with heart failure we have to give them maximum tolerated doses of ac inhibitors arbs or arnis or beta blockers for that matter provided there is a particular target heart rate so there is a particular target heart rate to be achieved about 60 or 70 beats per minute with that if the blood pressure is permitting we can escalate the dosage also the th- thing is how frequently you do it one thing is starting of a beta blocker should be after initial clinical stabilization after achieving the u volumic status not when the patient is very edematous or uh, when the patient is having pulmonary edema once they are off this acute phase you can start off then possibly based on the blood pressure and the heart rate response maybe every weekly once i would like to double or increase the dosage what will be the optimum dose of beta blocker for you in terms of uh, achieving the uh, beta blockade in a given patient yeah. of a heart failure yes. or a patient of angina pectoris yeah. in my practice frankly speaking in uh, the indian population i am comfortable with about 50 to 100 mg of metoprolol 
or about 5 to 7.5 milligrams of bisoprolol. So, this is the dose which they generally tolerate and this is the dose what we practically use it. Beyond that, we have the evabradins and um, other drugs, okay. Otherwise, uh, I mean even if uh, heart failure is a main thing, even digoxin as a second lane drug also can be added if it is a suitable patient with a lot of caveats of course. Uh, and China patients? Angina patients, of course, maximum tolerated dosage up to 10 milligrams of bisoprolol also have gone up. But the literature also has recommended up to about 20 milligrams of you know, occasional patient. Yeah. You may consider adding it or you may add an additional drug like everpredin if it is required. So, one thing no, is sorry. higher doses of beta blockers cause fatigue. So, that is a known thing and of course, there are other side effects. Men may not like it at all because of the Sexual. erectile dysfunction and uh, impotence that it is accused of. Uh, less so with uh, beta 1 uh, selective beta blockers. But uh, in my practice, more than 100 milligrams, they develop fatigue. So, even my electrophysiology so. friends also, some of them I have discussed with. So, more than 100 milligrams of metoprolol, they uh, usually develop some uh, fatigue. Fair enough. Okay. Now, let's turn to nephrologist as to how about his uh, dosing schedule of a bisoprolol in a given patient of chronic kidney disease with hypertension. Yeah, as I told the first drug should be calcium channel blocker and a beta blocker to start with and uh, uh, obviously when there is renal dysfunction, one drug would never suffice, it will be two to three drugs. Add to this that you have to bring in RAS blockade at uh, any stage, So, but RAS blockade as a first, this one would be difficult for me because first I have to, the blood high blood pressure itself would be the cause for the creatine having gone up, so settle that then see whether the creatine and potassium are stable and then only then uh, I'll have to bring in RAS blockade. But then RAS blockade is essential. So once I introduce that, I'll have to look at the other uh, drugs uh, that are, uh, uh, that which have to be reduced once the blood pressure comes down. So it may take about three to four months to before really get a full prescription going on. Yeah, roughly, yes, uh, uh, bisoprolol, most of my patients, of course, I don't believe that 2.5 causes any blood pressure reduction in my patients. So it has to be at least 5 to 10, 5 to 10 milligrams okay. minimum. Fair. And uh, carvedilol is about uh, 12.5 to even up to 25 milligrams at times. Fair enough. As there are no questions coming up from the audience floor, I take it that everybody is satisfied with the discussions and deliberations that have gone on now last about one and a half, just about that. Friends, on behalf of uh, the colleagues here, I would like to conclude by saying that we had a wonderful session on beta blockers, in particular bisoprolol, putting that into perspective of hypertension management in our clinical practice. Though there have been criticisms against uh, various guidelines, the recent guidelines from ESC and other guidelines have proposed to bring in beta blockers onto the central stage and use it effectively to take care of our patients with hypertension with or without comorbidities. In the absence of comorbidities, beta blocker were not considered as first choice, but the time has come for us to consider are the first choice. The best in the class could be a cardio selective, and best in the cardio selective for the high blood pressure patient could be bisoprolol, but you be the judge because the wisdom that you already have as a clinical practitioner for more than decades is enough for you to drive your conscience and write an optimum prescription for your patients, not just in your office practice, but also in your uh, telemedicine or various varieties of practice that we could not discuss today because of uh, lack of time. I hand over the mic to the organizers because it happens to be 9.45. Thank you so much and have a good evening. Enjoy your dinner. Thank you so much. It was a very elaborated uh, session and uh, it was a very scientific, scientifically discussed. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Nagraj Desai, sir, uh, for moderating this session. So, I will ask my colleague, uh, Mr. Vinay, to hand over the book. Okay. And our uh, main panelist, Dr. Uh,
again their own sir. And also Ip Kumar sir. And also I thank uh, all the doctors uh, who is in uh, spite of uh, their busy schedule they have come to this uh, CME program. May I request uh, your patronage for uh, BSOT and Metapro Excel which will motivate us for uh, many such meetings in coming days. So I request all, you, all of you to join dinner. Thank you.